over the past 20 years studying the creation science material, one of the key ideas that I've picked up in reading the scriptures is this. God says what he means and means what he says. That doesn't mean we're not supposed to use our intellect, and we can use that power to seek out the evidence of God's work in our midst. When it comes down to the real evidence for creation, we can see it in the sheer diversity and the size and the complexity of the universe, and therein we see God's hand at work. Let me show you some examples. The universe displays incredible variety. Consider snowflakes. Every one is different. Every cloud is different. Every planet, every galaxy is different. This variety is just as visible among organisms. Every individual is different from every other individual. Every giraffe has a unique pattern. Every zebra has distinct stripes. Every dog has a distinct personality. And every human is different from every other. Despite all this variety, it's easy to see which of these belong in the same group. As different as deer are from each other, we still recognize them as deer. As different as finches are from each other, we still recognize them as finches. The same is true of plants. There are thousands of species of orchids and thousands of species of grass, but we still call them orchids and grass. Modern scientists call each of these groups families. The Bible gives a clue about the origin of such variety. Genesis 1 says that God created distinct organisms after their kind. In fact, he uses this phrase, after its kind or after their kind, 10 times in the creation account. What does the biblical term kind refer to? It is possible that in most instances, these kinds are the groups of similar species that scientists recognize today as families. If so, God made an orchid kind, a grass kind, a deer kind, a finch kind, and many others. Within these kinds, he placed potential for amazing variety. The creation of similar things with differences demonstrates that God loves variety and God loves unity. The best explanation for this is God's very nature, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit three persons in one, loves both diversity and unity. He made 350,000 species of beetles alone, and that's the ones that we know about. The real number may be closer to half a million and by the way, because we have been given dominion and stewardship of this world, we have every responsibility and right to manage these bugs and other such things. On the fifth day of creation, after God spangled the universe with planets, stars, and galaxies, he introduced something completely new into creation, life. The Bible describes a whole range of things as living, from birds to cattle, from fish to humans, even God himself. Since God is a spirit and alive, this is a clue that life is not physical, but the Bible doesn't actually define what life is. When science textbooks try to define life, they describe DNA, or cells, or chemical reactions. Biology textbooks end up describing what living things are made of, and what living things do. They do not actually define life itself. What happens, for example, when an animal dies? DNA and cells are still in place, but life is missing. Life can't be weighed or measured. It seems to be beyond the tools of science. The non-physical nature of life may explain why biologists are so unsure about which things are alive. In fact, their list of living things does not entirely match the Bible's list. The Bible, for example, 
never describes plants as living. Instead, it calls them green things. The word living does not appear in the Bible until God made the animals of the sea two days after he created plants. The marvelous animals of the air, sea, and land are all described as living things. Where did this mysterious life come from? We can't even restore life to an animal that has died, let alone create life from scratch. The Bible tells us that life is a gift of God. The abundance of living things all around us is a daily reminder of our living God, who is the source of all life. Considering the stars, the latest count of galaxies is 126 billion. You can't hold that many grains of sand in your hands. In fact, with an estimated number of 10 to the 22nd power, there are fewer grains of sand on the entire Earth than there are stars in all the galaxies we have so far discovered. Not all evidence for creation is so obvious. One day, one of my confirmation students came to class wearing a t-shirt t-shirt said, stop plate tectonics. Now I'm not sure that he understood everything that was involved in that. As a matter of fact, I think he had his hands full just trying to remember and learn the meaning of the third article. But the idea was interesting. How long have continents been drifting? The real problem with the whole idea is in the rate of movement. One scientist says that what we call continental drift had to really be continental gallop around the time of Noah's flood. There isn't enough kinetic energy to create the Himalayas from continents that are merely drifting. Birds, now, birds are an interesting idea because what came first, the evolution of flying or the evolution of landing? <laughs> I mean, if the first bird learned to fly died in a crash landing, it makes it difficult to perpetuate the species. Sort of natural selection in reverse. The complexity, though, of a bird's flight is a concept called irreducible complexity. By definition, certain biological systems are just too complex to have evolved from simpler forms through the process of evolution. Perhaps no living thing has captured man's imagination more than birds. Birds were specially created on day five, before God made dinosaurs and other land animals. Their complex design works together in perfect harmony to make flight possible. Consider the common seagull. First, it's designed to be light. Its bones are hollow, but strengthened by braces. Engineers have adopted this same design in airplane wings and steel girders, because it's ideal for minimum weight and maximum strength. In addition to being lightweight, birds are well balanced with their weight centered under their wings. Powerful breast muscles pull the wings downward while an ingenious pulley system pulls the wings upward. Another design is the bird's wishbone. Formed by the fusion of the collarbones, the wishbone is both sturdy and flexible. So it keeps the force of the wing muscles from crushing the bird's chest. Birds also have a high-performance breathing system unique in the animal world. Rather than constantly lifting and lowering a diaphragm and ribs, their muscles pump air directly into air sacs and hollow bones. At the same time, the strong but light rib cage is held rigid by a clever combination of fused bones and struts. A critical design in birds is a broad surface area for lift. The bird's wings and feathers accomplish this beautifully. The central veins of feathers are hollow for lightness and crisscrossed with barbs and barbules for maximum strength. And at the base of the feathers, individually controlled muscles move and rotate each feather, changing the shape of the wing to maximize lift. Feathers in the tail and wings also control navigation. Every feature of birds, from the muscles in the chest to the feathers on the wings, is well designed for flight. 